Hello and welcome to the seventh video in this Bible study on the book of Genesis. Today we'll be covering the story of Jacob, Genesis chapters 25 verse 19 through chapter 31. My name is John Davis and I am the evangelization and Discipleship Coordinator at St. Matthew Catholic Church in Winter Haven, Florida. If you'd like to contact me, you can email me at evangelization at saintmcc.com. This Bible study is based off of a Catholic introduction to the Bible, the Old Testament, by John Bergsma and Brant Petrie. It can be purchased in both Kindle and hardcover at Amazon.com. The Bible study guide that we will be using for this lecture series is uh, Genesis, a Catholic Bible study by myself and this can also be purchased on Amazon.com. Genesis chapter 25 verse 21 says, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. By now, Isaac and Rebekah had been married for 20 years and still hadn't had any children. And Isaac considered fertility and barrenness to be in God's hands. And he doesn't try to take matters into his own hands like his father did. And he understands that divine assistance will be necessary for him and his wife to have a child just like it was for Isaac himself to be born. Genesis chapter 25 verse 22 says, The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Rebekah feared that she and her children were going to die, so they must have really been moving around a lot in her womb. Now she immediately sought the help of God. And the reason was is that where they were living was the same location where Hagar met the angel of God. And we saw that in chapter 16. And there's a good chance that Rebecca realized that this is where Hagar spoke to God. And we're going to see this a little bit later with Jacob and with his encounter with God that there was a strong belief that God showed himself to people or talked to people only in certain places. So this would have been a good place for Rebecca to seek God's help. Genesis chapter 25 verse 23 says, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. And two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. And we see from the moment that Jacob and Esau are born that they're rivals from the get-go. But this is more of a prophecy of the future because we don't really see Jacob uh, having control over Esau. That happens later on in the struggle between Israel and Edom. And the other thing that's weird is just the fact that usually the elder would control the younger. And here we're seeing that it's going to be the opposite of that. Genesis chapter 25 verse 25 says, The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. The Hebrew word for red, Edmoni, 
That same word is used to describe David in 1 Samuel. Now here it could be referring to Esau's skin color or his hair color. And Admoni is kind of a foreshadowing of what's to happen in that Esau gives away his birthright or sells his birthright for red lentil peas. And then it's also a wordplay on Edom, which is a name of a nation identified with the descendants of Esau. Genesis chapter 25 verse 26 says, Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Even from the womb, Jacob is trying to prevent Esau from getting that birthright. Jacob really seems to want this birthright. And the name Jacob implies deception as it means he grasps the heel. And that is similar to the English idiom of he's pulling your leg. And as someone's pulling your leg, they're trying to deceive you. Genesis chapter 25 verse 27 says, When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. They are totally opposites of each other in character and manners and habits. And you can look at Esau's being much like Cain in that he lived a rustic life and had a similar profession and, and manners as Cain. And then you can think of Jacob as being like Abel. Genesis chapter 25 verse 28 says, Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. As Isaac's firstborn son, Esau would have been favored, and he was entitled to the birthright and the blessing which becomes a bone of contention between Esau and Jacob. But also, it seems here like Isaac and Esau just had more in common. They both seem to like game, probably both hunters. And it's not uncommon for two people, whether they're related or not, that have common interests to get along better than two people who don't. Of course, this budding sibling rivalry is complicated by the fact that one parent likes one better and the other parent likes the other better. Genesis chapter 25 verses 29 and 30 says, Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. And red here, once again, the term they're using is Adam, and that echoes that Hebrew word Adamni, which was used to describe Esau's appearance. And this stew is later described as a lentil stew, and there are red lentils, and so this is describing a red lentil stew. Genesis chapter 25, verse 31 and 32 says, Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die of what use is a birthright to me. Now, birthright could mean one of two things. One could mean that it was only of first inheritance. And that meant that the firstborn son would receive a double inheritance to the other children. And we see this in Deuteronomy. And some would say that that is all the birthright would be. Others say that the birthright was an inheritance, but then it was also a blessing, a particular blessing from the father. So we don't know here what Jacob thought versus what Esau thought. And maybe they were both thinking of it 
in a different way. But no matter what, Esau shouldn't have thrown away. And it shows that really he he didn't have the right disposition to to get that universal blessing. Genesis chapter 25 verse 33 says, Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Swearing an oath meant that it was an irrevocable act. So once Esau swore that he was selling his birthright to Jacob, he couldn't take it back. And you could sell your birthright, so this was perfectly legitimate to do this. Genesis chapter 26 verse 1 says, Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to King Abimelech of the Philistines. This could have been the same Abimelech from the days of Abraham, but it's been close to 90 years since that first event and this one, so it could and maybe even more likely have been a different King Abimelech. If you remember, we talked last time that Abimelech is a pretty common name. Genesis chapter 26 verse 2 says, The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Settle in the land that I shall show you. This was God most likely visibly appearing to Isaac as he did to his father, Abraham, many times. And here God is just instructing Isaac to remain in the promised land. But he could move to a different location within that promised land, but just stay in the promised land. Genesis chapter 26 verse 3 says, Reside in this land as an alien, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will fulfill the oath that I swore to your father Abraham. God's just repeating the covenantal promise that he made to Abraham showing that it's passed down to Isaac and we'll see closer towards the end of today's video that God repeats it again to Jacob. Genesis chapter 26 verse 6 and 7 say, So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, My wife, thinking, Or else the men of this place might kill me for the sake of Rebekah because she is attractive in appearance. These events that are transpiring in Gerar most likely took place before Esau and Jacob were born. And that plays out in the fact that if they had some kids with them, it would have been much harder for Isaac to pull this deception or this lie on Abimelech and his people. And it's a very common occurrence, even in literature and movies today to put things out of sequence so the Bible's just doing that Genesis chapter 26 verses 8 and 9 say when Isaac had been there a long time King Abimelech of the Philistines looked out of a window and saw him fondling his wife Rebecca so Abimelech called for Isaac and said so she is your wife why then did you say she is my sister Isaac said to him, because I thought I might die because of her. Isaac must have lived close enough to King Abimelech that he would have noticed what they were doing in their tent or their dwelling. And that would probably show that Isaac was held in fairly high esteem uh, because he was living close to the king. Now, we talked about this last time, but the Hebrew word used here for fondling is at Mesachek and that was always mostly having sexual connotations to it it could though also if you look at Isaac's name Yitzhak it could be a word play on that but most likely not because Yitzhak as we know what Isaac's name it has to do with laughing and I don't think King Abimelech looking out and seeing Isaac and Rebecca laughing, I don't think he would have come to the conclusions that he did. 
Genesis chapter 26, verse 11 says, So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall be put to death. Abimelech's warning could be a caution based on a general belief that adultery with another man's wife could bring harm from the gods that he believed in. Or it could have even been him remembering or hearing about what happened earlier with Abraham when Abraham pulled the same trick to either him or a different king of Bemelech. Genesis chapter 26 verse 14 says, He had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household, so the Philistines envied him. Isaac's being described as having a lot of wealth like his father, and it makes sense in that Isaac did end up getting the majority of his father's wealth when he died. Genesis chapter 26 verse 15 says, Now the Philistines had stopped up and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of his father Abraham. And this is a recurring source of quarrels amongst nomads. We saw that with Abraham and it's still to this day a practice in that enemies of each other, this certain tribes that don't like each other, will often block wells, fill them up with sand and stones, or even throw like dead rotting carcasses in there. So it just kind of shows some more historical elements to this story. And we see lots of those throughout all the narratives once we get to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 26, verse 16 and 17 say, And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. The Philistines envy Isaac so much that Abimelech finally has to ask him to leave. It was probably causing a bunch of issues within their little city. And this very much recalls the conflict that occurred with Abraham and the other king of Bemelech. Genesis chapter 26, verse 26 and 28 says, Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Azath, his advisor, and Phicol, his commander of his army. They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we say, Let there be a oath between you and us and let us make a covenant with you. So we're seeing here that some of the same players, or at least the names of some of the same players, are involved as with the same covenant that was made with Abraham, because Fico was involved with that. Now once again, that could be a different Fico. Maybe that was another common name. But this is another piece of evidence to say that God's promise of a great nation has been fulfilled in that Abimelech wants to make a covenant with him just like with his father. Genesis chapter 26 verse 33 through 35 says, When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beri, from Hittite, and Beermoth, daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Esau was 40 when he married, so Isaac would now be 100 years old. And this just reflects Esau's kind of indifference to God in general by first off marrying a Hittite woman who was not of the sort that Isaac would want him to marry. And According to Josephus, who was a first century historian, these wives were daughters of heathen princes and raised in idolatry and with pride. And we're seeing here, too, that Esau picked them himself. He didn't let his father do that. And we know from earlier talks that back then it was common for the parents to pick the spouse for the child. And so I think that's just another indication of how Esau was kind of going 
away from not only God, but even from his family. Genesis chapter 27 verse 1 says, When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called his elder son Esau and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. Now, through tradition, it says that Isaac would have been 137 years old here and was getting close to death. So Isaac, at this point, would want to pass on that blessing to his son. And it's likely that Isaac wasn't aware that the birthright was sold earlier. And it's also interesting because we're going to see, and we see this a lot with these narratives, when there's blessings or oaths being done, that they're closely tied to a meal. And the meal's not just an afterthought like we have today, like after you get married, it's like everybody just has food because you're being hospitable. This was actually kind of a part of these ceremonies, of these blessings and these oaths and covenants and we even see that with Jesus in the Last Supper and when he instituted the Eucharist and the New Covenant he did it through a meal as well Genesis chapter 27 verses 3 and 4 say now then take your weapons your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me then prepare for me savory food such as I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may bless you before I die. And we're seeing here that importance of that meal like on the last slide I was talking about. And we know Esau did already sell his birthright. Now I'm just making the assumption that maybe he thought he was only selling the birthright itself and not the blessing and he didn't think they were both tied together. Now that's just speculation. Maybe he knew that he sold them both, but I'm gonna stick with that one uh, for this talk. So the birthright itself would have been about property and wealth passed from one generation to the next. And so that would have been like, he would have got more property and inheritance, whereas the blessing itself being separate but that would be a focus on future wealth prosperity and when I say wealth there I'm not just talking materialistic wealth but spiritual wealth as well and in this case it's way more important is because this is the blessing that Isaac got from his father Abraham which is that universal blessing from God so it's probably one of the most important blessings ever given and he's about to pass this down to his eldest son. Genesis chapter 27 verses 6 and 7 say, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me game and prepare for me savory food to eat that I may bless you before the Lord before I die. The text is clearly going to show that Rebekah instigates this whole plot as she does appeal to Jacob throughout the narrative three times to obey and do what she says. Now remember, Rebecca did get a prophecy from God that said that Jacob would basically rule over his older brother. So that would have implied that he would have that birthright. So here, maybe she's anxious and she wants to do this just to make sure that it actually happens. So instead of just completely trusting in God that it would happen, she's going to go and through her own means force this to happen. Genesis chapter 27 verses 9 and 10 say, Go to the flock and get me two choice kids so that I may prepare from them savory food for your father such as he likes. And you shall take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. So Rebecca's already figured out a pretty good deception. And if you think about it, she would know better than anyone what kind of food her husband would like. And one other thing to point out is that if Isaac 
and Esau were kind of conspiring to do this, then I think they would have done it more quietly and not made it so that Rebecca could hear. So for Esau and for Isaac, even if Isaac knew that Esau sold his birthright, I don't think either of them felt that they sold the blessing as well, where clearly Rebecca and Jacob probably think that the birthright and the blessing were sold together. Genesis chapter 27 verses 11 and 12 say, But Jacob said to his mother Rebekah, Look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a man of smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him, and bring a curse on myself, and not a blessing. Really, Jacob's not worried about this deception, and I think he's willing to go along with the plan, quite obviously, but he's just more worried about getting caught. And another thing to keep in mind is blessings were irrevocable, but so were curses. And so curses could be uh, something bad, and then the rest of your life you have to deal with that. Genesis chapter 27 verse 13 says, His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my word and go get them for me. Rebecca had enough confidence in God's promise of this that she really wasn't concerned about a curse from Isaac. And then secondly, maybe she felt so strongly that Jacob should get it that she would take this curse on willingly because in her eyes, Jacob getting this blessing was the right thing. Genesis chapter 27 verses 15 and 16 say, Then Rebekah took the best garments of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. And she put the skins of the kids on his hands and in the smooth part of his neck. It was very common for special occasions to wear your best garments same as like when you go to church hopefully you're wearing quote unquote your Sunday best now Isaac was blind but another thing to keep in mind is that your clothes end up kind of smelling like you especially back then when they didn't have washer and dryers and, and ways to wash clothes quite as regularly as we do so by putting on Esau's garments Jacob would have smelled more like Esau and it's been scientifically proven that if you lose one of your senses uh, like sight that other senses get enhanced so Isaac's sense of smell might have been enhanced because of his blindness Genesis chapter 27 verse 18 says so he went into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob says very little upon entering the tent, probably because he realizes he doesn't sound like Esau. And even with the response that Isaac gives, Isaac seems to think something's up a little bit in the way he responded. Genesis chapter 27 verse 19 says, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you have told me. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may bless me. St. Augustine connected this blessing of the younger to the future favoring of the Gentiles over the Jews. And some say even that Jacob may have prophetically understood that and how it is connected is that Esau was the firstborn like the Jews were the firstborn but God favored the Gentiles via the new covenant and so that's where that connection is Genesis chapter 27 verse 20 says but Isaac said to his son how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. Isaac seemed suspicious by asking that question, and it was probably a fairly legitimate question, because Esau would have had to go get his stuff, 
go find this game, kill it, bring it back, and then make a meal from it. And that would have taken quite a bit of time. Whereas Jacob probably just went and grabbed two lamb from their flock and then gave them to his mother to prepare. And that would have taken a lot less time. And they needed it to take less time because they had to beat Esau in to get that blessing. Now Jacob, and I don't think this was very smart, used his father's God, Yahweh, in his lie. And it really wasn't his own God yet. And that won't happen till he actually leaves his family home. Genesis chapter 27 verse 23 says, He, that being Isaac, did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. So this deception worked. And Isaac asked to feel uh, Jacob. And so the deception of the, the sheep skin actually worked and this blessing at this point though would have only been to carry on with the meal it wouldn't have been the actual blessing because as i said earlier the meals always took place and must have been part of the the celebration or the ritual that always took place before the actual blessing or covenant Genesis chapter 27 verse 29 says, Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Now this blessing that Isaac is giving to Jacob is not fully realized by Jacob. There's some elements of it that are, but it's mostly realized by his descendants. And even the temporal blessings that he is getting were but a shadow of those spiritual ones, which would eventually be granted to all of us who partake in the new covenant that Jesus made. Genesis chapter 27 verse 32 says, and this is after Jacob leaves and Esau shows up. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? And he answered, I am your firstborn son Esau. Isaac likely recognized Esau's voice, and he can't really comprehend, and was probably a little bit shocked that his son Jacob would have pulled this deception on him. Genesis chapter 27 verse 34 says, When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me also, father. Esau does not ask Isaac to take back the blessing he gave to Jacob because he would realize that you can't revoke a blessing once it's given. And Esau simply wants to receive a blessing too. And even that would be powerful if not of the same stature as the one that was given to Jacob. Genesis chapter 27 verse 36 says, Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and look, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Esau here is suggesting that Jacob does live up to his name, as a deceiver and we see that a lot in the bible where people actually do live up to their name and esau would have known probably better than anyone that jacob was a trickster he'd probably been tricked many other times throughout their their time together and i also think this shows that esau really felt that the birthright was different from the blessing and that he only sold the birthright to Jacob and, and not the blessing. Genesis chapter 27 verses 39 and 40. And this is the blessing that Isaac gives to Esau. It says, See, away from the fatness of the earth shall your home be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you break loose, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now the first part of this is, 
very similar to Jacob's promise of temporal prosperity, whereas the second part also is more like a prophecy. And we see that come true later in the Bible in that Esau's descendants become vassals to King David. So they're ruled by King David until the reign of Joram when they revolt and establish a kingdom of their own. Genesis chapter 27 verse 41 says, Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. He decides to kill his brother, but he really didn't conceal his plan very well because his mother finds out about it. And I would even make the argument that her sending Jacob away was good for Esau and she wasn't just thinking about Jacob's well-being I highly doubt she would have wanted her son Esau to be a murderer and end up really being the second Cain so I think it was good on Rebecca to send Jacob away even for Esau's well-being did God condone Jacob's deceit Jacob's deceit I think is often exaggerated because he did purchase Esau's birthright and it didn't involve deception now you could make an argument that he shouldn't have done it and he took advantage of a, a man who was about to die in his eyes right but still he did it legally and if he thought that he bought the birthright and the blessing then his actions wouldn't have been as bad as if he just totally stole it, as one would say. And really, it's his mother who kind of created and executed this plan. And Jacob did have some reservations. So, you know, you can't say that this is all on Jacob. Uh, circumstances and thoughts led to this. On, like I said, that he felt he already bought the the blessing as well and then his mother obviously was coaxing him as well and we actually see that Jacob gets punished pretty severely and ends up enduring a lot of penance he ends up serving his deceitful father-in-law for 20 years and this would have been very hard labor and think of it it said earlier on that Jacob basically didn't like to do strenuous hard labor so that would have been quite a punishment for him so even though it was meant for Jacob to get this blessing and God doesn't outright tell him it was wrong he still had to serve quite a long punishment for for his actions Genesis chapter 28 verse 1 says then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him you shall not marry one of the Canaanite women we see Isaac forgiving Jacob relatively quickly because by now he probably understood God's ultimate plan and I'm sure he would have talked to his wife about it and she could have even brought up what God had told her earlier now he's demanding especially because now in a way Jacob is the firstborn that he doesn't want him to marry outside his family just like he didn't marry outside his family he doesn't want the influence of people who are not under the one true God to be put on to Jacob Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 and 12 say Jacob left Beersheba and went down to Haran and he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth the top of it reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it the visions of angels is God's messengers and it's a reminder of God's constant care for his creatures in his messages coming down to people and then his messages coming up to him and it really just shows that God does reach down to us 
and we don't have to always just go to him. This ladder that Jacob sees in his dream is a, another foreshadowing of Jesus. And Jesus even talks about this himself in John chapter 1, verses 50 and 51, when Jesus meets Nathaniel, who in the other three Gospels is actually called Bartholomew, and who became one of the twelve apostles, he said to him, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending from the Son of Man. And that's basically saying that Jesus is that mediator between heaven and earth. And we even see that then in John chapter 14 verse 6 when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Once again, just kind of another reference to the fact that Jesus is the mediator between heaven and earth. Very similarly to how this ladder in the Old Testament was showing God and his how he was mediating between heaven and earth. Genesis chapter 28 verses 13 and 14 say, And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. This verse implies that Jacob sees God in the form of a man because he was standing beside him. And God's just reiterating that promise he made to Abraham and then to Isaac. And now he's making it to Jacob. So now the one true God is going to be the God of Jacob. Genesis chapter 28 verse 15 says, Now that I am with you, I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Here God is just giving that promise of divine protection to Jacob like he had done to his father Isaac and also for his grandfather Abraham. Genesis chapter 28 verses 16 and 17 say, Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Unlike Abraham and Isaac, Jacob had his divine encounter in a location that hadn't yet been associated with any divine appearances. And we talked a little bit about this earlier with Rebecca when she went to talk to God, being in a place that had already had such an encounter. And that was really the belief back then, which is called cosmic geography, that certain places were linked with divine appearances so this kind of underscores his astonishment that it happened not in one of those places now house of god that that's the hebrew word for that is beth elohim and that is typically used to describe a temple and temples were both divine abodes and places where divine activity happened Genesis chapter 28 verse 18 says, So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and sat it up for a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. Stone pillars were frequently used as religious objects in the Old Testament. A lot of times they were relating to idolatry, so you would see these stones put up for other gods, or false gods, and a lot of times people who believed in the one true God would destroy these stone monuments. And we see that in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But here Jacob is erecting one in honor of the one true God. And we'll see a little bit later even in this video, but there were other uses for these kind of stones and pillars like memorials for the dead. We'll see that in the next video in Genesis chapter 35. 
very similar to how we use stones as gravestones uh, today. And then treaties, we'll see that today uh, in this video. And then just any other important events, and we see that in Joshua. And then the pouring of oil on top of the pillars just indicated that it was holy. Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 and 21 say, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be with me. This vow is more than just acknowledging the one true God. It's also demonstrating that he already has unique veneration to the one true God. And he'll show that also by the building of the altar. Genesis chapter 28 verse 22 says, And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give one tenth to you. So this stone altar that he's making will basically be a temple. And now it's not clear if the one tenth was a one time thing or if it was a recurring uh, tithing. I'm assuming actually that it would be more of a recurring one in that at this stage, Jacob really didn't own anything. So he wouldn't be giving one tenth of hardly anything because he didn't really own anything. Genesis chapter 29 verses 10 and 11 say, Now when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of his mother's brother Laban, and the sheep of his mother's brother Laban, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of his mother's brother Laban. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. The kissing wouldn't have been because he already loved her. It would have just been a customary practice of the time. When you greeted someone, you'd kiss them. And his weeping could have been that maybe he already fell in love with her, but it also could have been that he realized that he had nothing to give to Rachel, so he couldn't really marry her at this point of time. Genesis chapter 29, verses 16 and 17 say, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. The beauty of Rachel was perfect and not just confined to one part like it was for Leah and some of the church fathers feel that these two sisters represented one in Leah the Jewish synagogues which was you know a part of the faith it didn't encompass all of it whereas Rachel with her perfect beauty covering her whole body was the church that Jesus instituted in that that is the fullness of the faith. Genesis chapter 29 verse 18 says, Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. As was the custom of the time, this proposal of marriage was made to the father without consulting the daughter. Then they would come up with a dowry. Now, normally a dowry would have been money or jewelry or gold. But if someone didn't have that stuff like Jacob didn't, he could offer himself in service. And he picked seven years to do that. Genesis chapter 29 verses 20 and 21 say, So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, that I might go into her, for my time is completed. Now Rebekah sent Jacob away, supposedly only temporarily. And now we see that seven years have already passed, so it's not very temporary. Now the language used where Jacob's calling Rachel his wife already, that would have been what happened because he would have been betrothed to uh, Rachel and she would have been betrothed to him. 
and technically they would have been considered husband and wife. This probably happened shortly after uh, Laban accepted the dowry from Jacob. And this is made clear when you read Deuteronomy in, in a couple different places. Genesis chapter 29 verse 25 says, When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? First off, Leah here has committed adultery in that, as we talked about on the last slide, Rachel and Jacob were considered married. And so Leah was taking a huge risk here in that if Jacob ended up rejecting her, she would have been an outcast in her society. Now, how did Jacob get fooled by this? Well, after the, the celebration for the wedding, it would have been dark. And of course, they didn't have electricity. So when he went into the tent, he wouldn't have seen her face. It would have been super dark at the time. And women were wearing veils at that time. So during the wedding, he wouldn't have seen her and only... Uh, the next morning would he have seen her and I I think even when they talk about her having lovely eyes that would have been the one thing that was showing through the veil so her eyes could have looked very similar to Rachel's now I think this really shows that at this point Jacob kind of turns the corner and is no longer technically a deceiver because he could have easily uh, rejected Leah but he doesn't do it and I think it probably wasn't lost on him how he fooled his father when his father was blind. And now his blindness of not being able to see because it was dark, because of his blindness, he got fooled as well. And I, I wouldn't be shocked if he realized that and, and then just turned a corner and became a better person. Genesis chapter 29 verses 26 and 27 says, Laban said, this is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Laban was following the local custom laws, but this was instead of the will of God. And we even see this today in certain societies where the oldest must get married first. Now, Laban should have told Jacob this way at the start but obviously he is a bigger deceiver even than Jacob is Genesis chapter 29 verse 28 says Jacob did so and completed her week then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife after the seven day of marriage celebration because they always had seven day marriage celebrations Rachel would have became Jacob's wife at that moment. So Jacob wouldn't have had to wait another seven years before Rachel became his wife. And the marriage of both sisters taking place at the same time was allowed at that time. But afterwards, it was prohibited. And we see that in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 18. Genesis chapter 29 verses 30 and 31 say, So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Unloved is sometimes translated as hated, but Jacob didn't hate Leah. He just loved Rachel more, and we can see why. I mean, he ended up working... 14 years for her now god would have opened leah's womb probably because he was showing some mercy but also to help her gain some more respect from her husband and just society in general genesis chapter 29 verse 32 says leah conceived and bore a son and she named him reuben and we see in the successive verses after this that leah ends up having four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And we're seeing here the formation of the 12 tribes of Israel has started. 
Genesis chapter 30 verse 1 says, When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. And she said to Jacob, Give me children or I shall die. St. Chrysostom believed Rachel was threatening to kill herself here because of the jealousy she had for her sister. And really, if you think about it, in these polygamous relationships, there's going to be jealousy between the wives. It's really unavoidable. And even in this scenario, both Rachel and Leah would have had separate apartments and would have probably spent equal time with Jacob. But this whole system of polygamy is, for lack of a better word, evil. And it violates God's original ordinance of one man and one woman uniting in one flesh. And time and time again throughout the Bible, we see how polygamy just ruins relationships and families. Genesis chapter 30 verse 2 says, Jacob became very angry with Rachel and said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Now, Rachel's plea for conception is considered irrational by Jacob because Jacob believes it to be all on God on if Rachel gets pregnant or not. And that really is a sharp difference in how Jacob responds to Rachel's barrenness compared to how his father responds to Rebekah's barrenness. Isaac petition God for aid and Jacob here is really denying any wrongdoing himself and we'll see in a minute he goes the route of Abraham and Sarah and how he and his wife deal with this Genesis chapter 30 verse 3 says then she said here is my maid Bilal go into her that she may bear upon my knees and that I too may have children through her so like Sarah, Rachel's resorting to offering Jacob her servant as a concubine so that she can have children to raise. And Bilal ends up having two sons, Dan and Naphtali. Genesis chapter 30, verse 9. And this is Leah trying not to be undone because now she stopped bearing children. So after she sees what Rachel did, she decides basically to do the same thing. And it says, when Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her maid Zephah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. And Zephah had two sons, Gad and Asher. Genesis chapter 30 verse 14 says, In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. In the days of wheat corresponds roughly to the month of May, and mandrakes would ripen in March or April, which corresponds roughly to the time that you would have had this wheat harvest. So you're seeing some historicity to this story in that. Now Reuben would have only been around four years old, so he'd have been pretty young. Now in ancient times, Mandrakes were considered to possess magical powers related to fertility, and today they do still feel like that mandrakes can help some people with their fertility problems. But for Rachel, we're seeing that she was so desperate that now she's resorting to supplements to hopefully help herself get pregnant, really not probably relying too much on God. Although we see this doesn't work, because it ends up being another three years before she does end up getting pregnant and she gets pregnant through God's blessing. Genesis chapter 30 verses 17 and 19 say, And God heeded Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. So before Rachel gets pregnant, I guess to add insult to injury in her mind, uh, Leah has two more sons, Ischar and Zebulun. Genesis chapter 30, verse 22 and 24 says, Then God remembered Rachel, and God heeded her and opened her womb. 
and she named him Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. In picking this name, Rachel is looking both to the past and the future, because Joseph can have two meanings. If you spell it Aesop, that means taking away. So Rachel is basically thanking God for taking away her infertility. If you spell it Aesop, that means to add. So Rachel is asking God to bless her again with another son, which God eventually does. But unfortunately for Rachel, that ends up uh, killing her. Now the thought is that Joseph was born at the end of Jacob's time of slavery or servitude and it's a prefiguration of Jesus and we see there's many ways that Joseph is a prefiguration of Christ but in this sense Christ came to redeem us from slavery and so Joseph is born after Jacob's slavery ends Genesis chapter 30 verse 26 says Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go for you know very well the service I have given you. So Jacob is asking Laban to let him go. Now at this point Jacob has 11 sons and one daughter and he will eventually have a 12th son as we know. That will be the 12 tribes of Israel. But Jacob basically wants to go and at this stage he doesn't have really anything yet. Uh, but he's just going to trust in God in his wanting to return to his homeland of Canaan. Genesis chapter 30 verses 27 and 28 say, But Laban said to him, If you will allow me to say so, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give them. Divination here means discerning the will of a deity based on the using of an object or just an omen or any kind of method that you might use to contact uh, a deity. And Laban here, of course, is against the separation, mainly for the fact that he's gotten wealthy from it. He doesn't really care or love his daughters or Jacob that much. He seems fairly selfish. And he's observed over time just how much God's blessings actually kind of rubbed off on him. And that's a good testimony of really if a good person is around, even people who aren't quite so good, that that blessing that they get can kind of go off on others as well. Even to this day that happens. Genesis chapter 30 verse 31 says, he said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again feed your flock and keep it. So here Jacob's requiring no wages. And he's just really committed himself entirely to what God's providence will provide. Genesis chapter 30 verse 32 says, let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and such shall be my wages. Eastern sheep were generally white and goats black, and spotted and speckled ones were pretty rare. So Jacob's proposal of removing all existing ones of that description was really not asking for much at all. And He's basically saying there he's going to stick around a while so he can grow his flock from amongst that little bit. And I don't think this was him being deceiving at all. I think he realized and had confidence in his ability to grow that little bit into a big flock. Genesis chapter 30 verses 34 through 36 says, Laban said, good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it, and every lamb that was black, and put them in charge of his sons. And they set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, while Jacob was pasturing the rest of Laban's fleet. The proposal was a great one for Laban, even if he wasn't about to cheat, but he probably had an idea that Jacob had something up his sleeve, so 
he decides to kind of change the deal a little bit and sends away all of Jacob's freshly acquired lambs and sheep with his sons away from the rest of the flock, that would make it much harder for Jacob to influence what kind of sheep and lambs were born. Genesis chapter 30 verses 37 and 38 says, Then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plain, and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the rods. He set the rods that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places where the flocks came to drink, and since they bred when they came to drink. Jacob had observed that these rods kept constantly before the eyes of the females while they were gestating would have an influence on what the future offspring looked like and one can probably make the assumption that this was God's uh, doing to help get Jacob a bigger flock and the watering trough so even though Jacob's sheep and lambs had been sent away a lot of times there was only one watering trough, so they would have had to come back to drink. So he could have manipulated and influenced them a little bit during those moments. Genesis chapter 30 verse 39 says, The flocks bred in front of the rods, and so the flocks produced young that were striped, speckled, and spotted. As I already said, this is proof in my eyes that God intervened to kind of make all this happen. And we know that Jacob, as I already said, when he talks about how this plan went off, that he was talking with an angel of God and, and how to pull this off. Genesis chapter 30 verses 41 and 42 says, Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob laid the rods in the troughs before the eyes of the flock. They might breed among the rods, but for the feebler of the flock, he did not lay them there. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. So remember the rods would influence the the little babies in there and then they would end up being speckled and spotted if they made it amongst the rods. So Jacob knew and this would usually be in the spring that the stronger the flock would be bred from the spring. So he put the rods out then and then in the autumn the weaker ones would be and he left those for Laban. Genesis chapter 30 verse 43 says, Thus the man grew exceedingly rich and had large flocks, and male and female slaves and camels and donkeys. So Jacob has not really taken what was Laban's, but by his own methods and with God's help, he's become rich kind of on his own, whereas Laban now has a diminished flock. Genesis chapter 31 verse 3 says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your ancestors and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So here God is kind of pushing or prodding Jacob into leaving. And maybe Jacob had just gotten so used to this environment that he was comfortable with it and didn't want to leave on his own without being prodded. Or maybe he wanted more and more wealth, and now God's like, Well, you have enough Let's move, get out of this situation. Genesis chapter 31, verses 7 and 9. And Jacob talks to his wives and he says to them, Your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. So here he's justifying his actions and he says, well, look, your father changed my wages 10 times. And 10 could have meant exactly how many times it was changed, or that could just mean that he changed it many times. Genesis chapter 31, verses 14 through 16 say, Then Rachel and Leah answered him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has been using up the money given for us. All the property that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. 
So having heard Jacob's reason for wanting to leave, Rachel and Leah express their approval to leave as well because they have their own grievances and so they readily agree to this separation. Laban should have kept not for himself the dowry. He actually should have gave it back to his wives. And really, with all the wealth he had, he should have even given them more. Genesis chapter 31, verses 19 and 20 says, Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household goods. And Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean, in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. If Jacob didn't leave quietly, Laban probably would have acted violently towards them and tried to make them stay. The word gods here in Hebrew is teraphim, and that could have been used for like domestic worship, which would have been considered idolatrous. But the precise meaning of the word teraphim is not known. And it is referred to to things like household gods or idols or sometimes even just figurines that were thought to represent uh, people from the spiritual world. But we even see teraphim sometimes used without any hint of idolatry as in 1 Samuel. Genesis chapter 31 verse 24 says, But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream by night and said to him, Take heed that you say not a word to Jacob, either good or bad. So by this point, Laban has started pursuing them, and it would have been three days, and he's going to catch up with them on the seventh day. But this is God warning Laban to do no harm to Jacob or anyone in his household, and he's cautioning Laban to be mindful of his words. Now this shows that Laban must have had some belief in the one true God and that God can communicate with him in a dream. And it actually makes sense. Look at all the good that came from Jacob worshiping this one true God. Laban would have saw that and seen that a lot of Laban's wealth came about because of Jacob and Jacob worshiped this one true God. Now Laban doesn't exactly follow what God says, but at least he doesn't use violence Genesis chapter 31 verses 26 and 27 say, Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You have deceived me and carried away my daughters like captives of the sword. Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and not tell me? I would have sent you away with mirth and songs with tambourine and lyre. So the customs were if you were leaving and going on a long journey that your family and friends would accompany you. For quite a long distance on this journey and singing songs and whatnot so that would have been the case usually but Laban I don't think would have done that and I think Jacob realizes that Genesis chapter 31 verses 29 and 30 say it is in my power to do you harm but the God of your father spoke to me last night saying take heed that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad even though you had to go because you longed greatly for your father's house, why did you steal my gods? The second accusation would have been much more severe in the eyes of Laban than the first one of just, why would you leave without telling me? Now here, the word gods is translated as Elohim, which would have been the more generic term for God versus Yahweh, which is a more personal term. Usually Elohim could have been used to reference basically any God. Genesis chapter 31 verses 31 and 32 says, Jacob answered Laban, because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. But anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of your kinsfolks, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Jacob doesn't admit to stealing the teraphim because he doesn't know that Rachel stole it. So he's really only responding to the inquiry about why did you depart without telling me. Genesis chapter 31 verses 34 and 35 says, 
Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt all about in the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of the woman is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household gods. Some church fathers believe Rachel stole these idols to get her father away from idolatry by removing his chance to sin. Now others say that she was actually an idolater herself until Jacob entirely banished that practice once he gets back to Canaan. Genesis chapter 31 verse 36 says, Then Jacob became angry and upbraided Laban. Jacob said to Laban, What is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? And in the next few verses, he's going to rapidly lay out his grievances for these 20 years of labor and all that he endured. And his tone of being angry is understandable with all he went through. Genesis chapter 31 verse 42 says, If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction in the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Fear of Isaac is just the divine title for God. And we see that again in verse 53. Yahweh, the God of Abraham, whom Isaac and Jacob's father revered, he is the one being referenced here, not just Elohim. Genesis chapter 31 verses 44 through 46 says, Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinfolk, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there by the heap. So we see here, just like what happened before, that there's stones and there's a heap and there's also a meal. And that's very common, as we already said, about covenants. So this is just another pointing of the common practice of what happened with covenants. Genesis chapter 31 verse 42 says, This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, that I will not pass between this heap to you, and you will not pass between this heap and this pillar to me for harm. To this day, heaps of stones which were used for these sort of things are still found throughout the region in, in lots of them. So these kind of covenants and oaths and memorials, these were very, very common all over the place. Genesis chapter 31 verses 53 and 54 says, May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, and Jacob offered a sacrifice on the height and called his kinfolks to eat bread. And they ate bread and tarried all night in the hill country. There's no indication in the stories of Abraham that his brother Nahor had knowledge of or followed the one true God. So here Laban's talking about more than one God. And even the Hebrew word that's used here for judge is plural suggesting that it was more than one God. But we see Jacob only swears to the one true God. And then here, we're seeing that bread is being used in this covenant for eating, just like we see in the Last Supper. And that concludes our discussion for today. Next time, we will be covering Genesis chapters 32 through 36 and hopefully you'll watch that video as well. Bye.